So I think that's all of kind of that's all of the housekeeping um, details. So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Finger. Dr. Finger is an associate professor in the Department of Clinical Neurological Sciences at the Schulich School of Medicine at the University of Western Ontario. And she's also a behavioral neurologist at Parkwood Institute of St. Joseph's Healthcare in London, Ontario. Dr. Finger's clinical practice and research focus on disorders of cognition and emotion, including patients with frontotemporal dementia and other neurodegenerative diseases and dementia that present with changes in behavior or language. So it is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Finger. Great, thank you, Tara. Um, I was thinking today how much I usually enjoy, you know, coming over in person, driving to the McCormick home and, and um, talking with a support group or, or for the seminars um, there at the main building. So I'm, I'm looking forward hopefully to doing that. Um, before too long, but we were saying there are a lot of advantages to, to online and the convenience and flexibility that offers. So thanks everyone for joining uh, tonight um, on your evening uh, personal hours. Um, I was asked to talk about frontotemporal dementias and give an update. And so as you can see, that'll be the focus, uh, not quite from A to Z, but from B to T, biomarkers, uh, which are signs that we can use to track um, the disease or to identify it, and then to tell you where we are uh, in terms of treatment uh, practically and, and research options. Um, I've tried to balance kind of starting from, from the, the basics so that we're all um, comfortable with the definitions and terms, uh, recognizing there may be some people a bit newer to the group or the topic, um, but quickly we'll get into sort of the most current and latest findings um, that hopefully are of interest to most and, and certainly to those that have been coming for a few years. Um, I've got a slide of disclosures here. There isn't anything that I've got a, a financial interest in per se that, um, we'll that I'll discuss today. Um, though I will talk about a few clinical trials that are coming through pharma where I have been asked to um, uh, provide some advice or be a consultant. So I thought we would have three main parts of tonight's talk. Uh, first, that sort of summary review of dementias and frontotemporal dementia. Um, the second part will focus on uh, key symptoms and with a particular zoom in on apathy and empathy deficits, which we've um, done some work ourselves in and which continue to be an area of research. And then finally, to talk about clinical trials uh, that are um, hopefully in the pipeline of drugs aiming to slow or prevent FTD, and, and how do we can think about those as those opportunities are coming up in the next few years. So to start with the basics, of course, dementia is a term that we all know, uh, but I just wanted to give you the kind of scientific or medical definition. For us, dementia describes a condition which represents the loss of thinking or cognitive functioning to the extent that it interferes with someone's usual activities. They can no longer do what they used to do. And that means that calendars and notes don't compensate even despite those kinds of strategies. Um, their memory is too poor or their language or their decision-making uh, to engage in the hobbies uh, socialization or professional work that they did. Now, if we start with that definition, you can imagine there are a lot of causes of dementia. So under this umbrella term of dementia, when we're talking about as we age, we're typically talking about these main four. The most common, of course, being Alzheimer's disease. And because it is so common, sometimes it gets used interchangeably with the term dementia although now you can see those are different. Frontotemporal dementia, our focus tonight, is probably the second most common cause of younger onset dementia. So that would be dementia that affects people in their 40s, 50s, and early 60s, though certainly the onset can range anywhere from one's 30s to one's 90s. There's really no upper limit. Lewy body disease as a cause of dementia and vascular disease, which would be strokes or bleeds in the brain leading to dementia are increasingly common as we age as well. 
So what defines these different dementias ultimately are the pattern of changes in the cells that we can see in the brain after someone passes away, if we look at their brain tissue. So that's how these diseases were historically defined and how they continue to be defined ultimately today. They have different symptoms, not so much because they have different molecular patterns, but they have different symptoms because they affect different parts of the brain. So the symptoms that we see in dementia really arise from the location of the brain that's most affected. In Alzheimer's disease here, most commonly it starts in the temporal lobes in a structure called the hippocampus that we can think of as the save button of the brain. And in, in Alzheimer's disease, if we looked at a, a tissue sample under the microscope and used some special staining, we would see these kind of blobs or more diffuse circles, which are abnormal accumulation of a protein or molecule called amyloid. And then these dark black tangles within the neurons themselves composed of tau sticking in the cells in that part where it shouldn't normally. And so that is ultimately what defines Alzheimer's disease. Lewy body disease and Parkinson's disease feature a different molecule building up in the brain cells. This time it's called alpha-synuclein and it clumps in these circles which a long time ago were coined Lewy bodies by the person that described them. And hence dementia, when we see this kind of inclusion in the cell is called Lewy body disease or Lewy body dementia. The same alpha-synuclein builds up in Parkinson's disease, but there it starts in motor regions of the brain stem rather than in the cortex or the thinking part of the brain. In Lewy body disease, the changes tend to start in the occipital lobes. And that's one reason why we see a fair bit of uh, visual hallucinations and changes in visual processing in Lewy body disease. Finally, and what we'll focus on for most of the remainder of the talk are the frontotemporal dementias, which are a group of diseases that typically start in the frontal lobes or the temporal lobes. And they feature most commonly one of two different molecular changes in the cells either the accumulation of tau, that same molecule that we see in Alzheimer's, however, in frontotemporal dementia, a slightly different form of it builds up and it builds up in the absence of amyloid. So that's how we technically distinguish Alzheimer's from frontotemporal dementia at the cellular level. Or we now recognize that about half the time, frontotemporal dementia is caused by molecular changes in a molecule called TDP43. The epidemiology of frontotemporal dementia, as I mentioned, is that it is uh, probably the second, following Alzheimer's disease, the second most common young onset dementia, meaning well before the age of 65. Prevalent studies suggest that because it is underdiagnosed and underrecognized, that it is probably at least 20 cases per 100,000 people um, between the ages of 45 and 64, and that's probably an underestimate, so probably even higher than that. 40% of patients with frontotemporal dementia have a positive family history that likely indicates some hereditary component at least, in that there's a history of early onset dementia in other family members of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, which can be genetically linked to frontotemporal dementia in some cases, or Parkinson's disease. And that's because symptoms of Parkinson's disease can happen over the course of frontotemporal dementias, even though the molecular changes causing that Parkinson's disease are still those classic for FTD. Now a smaller percentage, 10, 15, 25% of patients with FTD have what's called an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. And that's where it's hitting at least one member of every generation. And that tells us that the disease in those cases seems to be caused by a single gene mutation that can be passed on uh, to one's offspring with a 50-50 chance that any one offspring or one child would get that mutation. I mentioned that FTD and ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease are linked, and we know about 15% of patients with frontotemporal dementia develop ALS, and the converse is true. 
So far, other than genetic risk factors, the only known environmental risk factor for FTD is head injury. That can be concussion or a more severe traumatic brain injury. However, this doesn't explain the majority of patients who get FTD. And as always note, the majority of people who have a concussion do not develop FTD. So this is really only explaining a little bit of the incidence. The sex distribution uh, between men and women for FTD is really quite similar. So it doesn't typically affect one sex more than the other. And there are three main clinical subtypes of frontotemporal dementia uh, that we tend to see. The most common one here showing the, the blue portion of the frequency pi as behavioral variant. This is a variant that um, certainly features changes in personality and behavior as the key symptoms for a while. The other two subtypes of frontotemporal dementia typically start with language changes or quite significant language changes at the time of behavioral changes. The first is a non-fluent variant, which is sometimes called non-fluent primary progressive aphasia. And the other is semantic variant, sometimes called semantic dementia or semantic PPA. Now the behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia features changes in behavior that we can see in all three of those clinical subtypes of FTD, even the language variants. In FTD, we tend to see early behavioral disinhibition. So patients who previously had polite manners, um, were very courteous, uh, start to say things that are out of character and, and really um, kind of make the, the family's jaw drop of, of why are they saying this? It makes no sense. These things might be offensive or just socially tactless for the situation. Early on, we also tend to see apathy or that kind of um, reduction in activities, uh, whether physical, social, or cognitive. Many patients early on have an early loss of sympathy or empathy. So these were individuals that were always, you know, uh, warm and, and thoughtful and caring and empathetic. And because of the regions the brain, of the brain that are involved early on in FTD, um, their ability to understand and share other people's feelings is degraded, and we'll talk more about that. Some patients with FTD will develop early what we think of as compulsive or repetitive behaviors. Um, sometimes these are simple, just tapping, fidgeting. Other times they're more complex, like needing to wash things a certain number of times, um, to X out things in a magazine that they see, and, and that can really run the gamut of, of unusual repetitive behaviors. And then finally, it's quite common that many patients with FTD experience changes in their eating preferences and in the amount that they eat, with the most common change being that patients tend to crave more sweets and junk food. And so, you know, sometimes if, if they were left to go shopping on their own, the entire cart would be filled uh, with cookies and ice cream and chocolate. Um, without any of uh, the proper foods that they typically would eat. And we know, you know, and I, I don't have to tell the, this audience here, I know that these symptoms uh, are very, very difficult for caregivers and families to deal with both emotionally and practically. And so the degree of caregiver burden is high from all of them. This is an example of the most common biomarker that we use to look at FTD. Um, being MRI imaging or brain imaging. So of course we take a detailed clinical history when someone comes in, we look for those key features on the last slide. And then we look to see, are there any explanations in the brain uh, for those changes, such as a stroke, a tumor, an infection, et cetera. Most of the time, if the disease has been gradual and onset and progressive, there isn't. But then what we can see is shrinkage or atrophy being our technical term for that, most predominantly in the frontal lobes. So this was an MRI of a woman in her 50s presenting with those kinds of behavioral changes. On the left of your screen is the frontal lobe and on the right half is the back of the brain. And in the brain tissue here is in light gray and the black are spaces uh, between the folds of the brain or in the brain. And what I hope you can see, and if you can see my mouse here, are that the spaces in the middle parts of the frontal lobe 
are quite extended and the gray brain there is shrinking in comparison to the nice full plump cortex that we see in the posterior parts of the brain. So why frontotemporal dementia affects the frontal lobes or temporal lobes so focally and spares the rest of the brain is one big scientific mystery that's getting um, a lot of attention. Here's another example. This is just a different orientation. So this is as though the patient's lying on their back and we're looking at slices uh, coming up from the bottom towards the top. Here, the top half of the, the image is the frontal lobe and temporal lobe. The back half of the image um, is the uh, back of the brain or the parietal cortex. And um, what I'll just draw your attention to, if you can see this red line I've drawn, is that now on this image, the brain is uh, gray and the spinal fluid around it is white. And so you can see there's a lot more space in between the gray brain regions in this part of the frontal lobes and a lot more white or spinal fluid filling the void. And that's in comparison to the posterior back parts of the brain here, where we see normal volumes of gray matter and normal space in between the brain. These are some further examples of atrophy in frontotemporal dementia, this time affecting the temporal lobes more so. So this would be another scan where the patient's lying on their back. Here are the eyes. And here we're in the temporal lobes. And again, it's so striking how you could draw a line and really the back part of the brain is normal in size and shape. And here in the front part of the temporal lobes, the brain tissue is almost gone. We only see a little string-like remnant with space throughout this region. And in this sample or in this patient, um, to a lesser extent, that left temporal lobe is involved as well. Again, the, the focal region reason um, that this part of the brain is so severely affected while other parts are spared is not yet well understood. If someone passes away and asks that the pathologist look at their brain tissue after death to make a specific molecular diagnosis, um, then we have the opportunity to see the brain. And in frontotemporal dementia, what we saw on MRI is this nice plump brain in the back being normal here in this patient in the parietal and temporal lobes. And then on the left of your screen, in contrast is the frontal lobe and you can see the space between the folds of the brain um, being the hallmark of frontotemporal dementia. So frontotemporal dementia, even though we still have a lot to learn about it, um, was recognized over a century ago. And it was a contemporary of Dr. Alzheimer named Arnold Pick, who described the first patients who um, may have had frontotemporal dementia or did. The patients that Dr. Pick saw at that time were younger in their 40s or 50s and had behavioral and language changes early on. And when Dr. Pick and Dr. Alzheimer looked at their brain tissue, instead of seeing the uh, amyloid and tau changes that Dr. Alzheimer had described earlier, they saw these rounded inclusions and discovered eventually that those were um, comprised of the tau molecule. And since this was uh, based on Dr. Pick's original patients, they called these abnormal inclusions in the brain Pick bodies. And so for a long time, frontotemporal dementia was called Pick's disease. To help with the, the naming and, and making sure everyone's talking about the same thing, about 10 years ago, or even more now, 15, the field decided to switch from calling it Pick's disease to calling it frontotemporal dementia though we still call this particular subtype of FTD when we see the PIC bodies in the brain, um, the PICS disease subtype of frontotemporal dementia. Now, I showed you before and, and with this inclusion that many of our patients with frontotemporal dementia um, appear to have abnormal changes in their cells of two molecules, either tau or TDP43. But it's not even that simple, and I recognize that's not simple either. At the top here, this oval with BVFTD in the middle um, is colored to reflect the different kinds of molecular changes that we can see in the cells of patients who present clinically with behavioral variant FTD. 
So you can see it's really a rainbow of colors, a rainbow of different pathologies or cellular changes from tau and different types of tau abnormalities to TDP, and then less common uh, versions, FUS and others. And the reason I'm showing this is because um, still the field has some assumptions that most likely if we're going to develop treatments that can successfully slow the progression of FTD or hopefully one day prevent it, that these different colors, these different molecular types are likely to need different treatments. And so that gives you some sense of the complexity of finding a treatment for FTD. It's really gonna be finding many treatments for FTD and how much we still need to look at the brain tissue to ultimately understand what was causing a specific patient symptoms and to learn as much as we can about what caused that cellular change. So many of these pathology studies have then led to new genetic discoveries, which give us critical insights as to what's happening early on in the cell that ultimately leads to the problem. With this um, background, uh, one of the families of our patients uh, several years ago now um, was quite inspired to um, help in London uh, to advance knowledge and um, research about these conditions as much as possible, of course, with the ultimate goal of, of treating and preventing them. And so our official launch is going to be coming up in December. Um, for the DEC Brain and Biobank in London, Ontario. This is uh, basically um, a formal opportunity for us to, to curate and bring together uh, the tremendous wealth of patient stories that we have about their background and symptoms and their clinical course, um, the brain tissue that our pathologists have very carefully examined and detailed over the years, uh, the blood biomarkers that patients have generously donated as they participate in research, in some cases spinal fluid where that was obtained, and then the really advanced imaging that we have in London, whether it's MRI scans, CAT scans, and PET scans. And so this is a, a data set that is coming together and will be continuing to grow in the future that we'll make available to researchers both locally and internationally to help us understand what is happening in these conditions and how we can stop it. So um, I'll shift now uh, from part one to part two, where we'll focus a little more on some of the most common symptoms that we see in behavioral variant FTD, as well as in the other subtypes um, and how we're thinking about trying to, to make those better. So apathy in FTD uh, is that loss of motivation, loss of initiation. And when we hear stories in the clinic, um, these are the kinds of examples that we hear that we would characterize as apathy. These are people who were previously active and industrious, um, parents, workers, colleagues, um, and really they start to uh, become less and less physically active, less and less socially active, less and less cognitively active, even though they're physically well, and even though they still can speak and, and can think. When uh, correlations with this emergence of apathy or loss of motivation have been made with brain MRI volumes, it's really um, atrophy in the middle part of the frontal lobe that seems to correlate and go along with apathy. So this region in particular, uh, seems to be critical for being that starter of the brain's engine, so to speak. I, I gave a definition of apathy um, on the last slide. This is how we think of it more formally. And right now we don't have treatments for apathy, not in FTD and not in any condition. Certainly apathy can be seen in Parkinson's disease, in depression, in schizophrenia, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so uh, our group and one of my graduate students now, uh, Ruby uh, Malik, um, are looking at trying to break down what might be the different components of apathy and maybe try and target those components more specifically. So we think about someone's ability to initiate, to plan, and then we break down motivation to think, 
you know, are they no longer wanting to go play golf because they're no longer experiencing the rewarding feeling from it that they used to? Or the same kind of question of why they're not calling their daughter um, or their friends anymore. And then the flip side might be that in some patients, perhaps their brain is still signaling that rewarding feeling that they used to get from that activity, but it may be that the brain is computing that the effort it would take to do that is too great and therefore it's not worth it. And so we're currently trying to look at patients with different tasks on the computer to disentangle um, where apathy may stem from um, brains that are no longer willing to make the effort because they've, they've misjudged how effortful it is or brains that are no longer processing that reward like they used to. Related to apathy with a fair bit of overlap um, are empathy deficits in frontotemporal dementia, particularly empathy deficits and social apathy or that loss of, of reward and interaction with others. These are some um, of the more extreme examples uh, that we've seen over the years uh, in patients with FTD. And again, these were striking changes from their baseline personality. And as I mentioned at the bottom, you know, although often there's a, a striking example or two that really brings to the family's attention that something is wrong, um, before that and following that, we know that there, you know, day in and day out, hour in and hour out are changes where patients just no longer are attentive or, or um, caring seemingly about the needs of others or the perspectives of others. And that's what makes it one of the hardest things for family members to deal with. When we think about developing treatments for empathy, um, similarly, we wanna start with a common definition and a definition that we like from neuroscience is that empathy is an affective or an emotional response that's more appropriate to someone else's situation than your own in that moment. When we feel empathy, our brain both figuratively and actually literally kind of puts us into someone else's shoes. So when we see someone else looking afraid or upset or happy, the parts of our brain that would activate if we were feeling that emotion, activate when we look at someone else feeling that emotion. And so our brains really do help us to experience what they're feeling. Now in frontotemporal dementia, we know that patients um, have new difficulties recognizing these kinds of emotional expressions. And that we think is one key reason to why their empathy starts to fail. We can study this um, at the clinic or here at Robarts Research Institute by having patients look at emotional facial expressions while they complete MRI scans. And we can look at the picture of their brain activation while they're doing that. In this study that was completed by one of my graduate students several years ago now, we found that in comparison to age-matched healthy adults, our patients with frontotemporal dementia showed reduced brain activation when they were looking at these emotional facial expressions um, compared to control. So these regions in blue and green, um, while looking at disgust faces, were less active in our patients with FTD as were these areas in the back of the brain, which are visual processing areas. So both the emotional areas in the frontal and temporal lobes and the visual areas are less active. Similar patterns were seen when they were looking at angry expressions and even happy expressions as well. With that, our group started to think about what might be available to try to boost the signaling in those brain regions, particularly when patients are engaged in social interactions or, or trying to understand someone else's emotion. And we started to follow this emerging literature in the field around the hormone oxytocin. So oxytocin is a hormone or a peptide that all of our brains produce, both men and women. And it was recognized beginning in the 1990s and since then, that oxytocin has fundamental roles in how our brain processes different kinds of social interactions. So oxytocin, when it is given across a variety of species, including humans to some extent, improves um, social interactions and pair bonding. In birds, it stimulates nest building 
uh, grooming behaviors. It seems to reduce anxiety, um, though it may increase maternal instincts to protect one's young, even with a bit of aggression, at least in, in animal models where needed. Oxytocin in humans is produced in a structure deep in the middle of the brain called the hypothalamus. And from there, neurons send it to parts in particular of the frontal and temporal lobes. And so we think that oxytocin signaling may be reduced in frontotemporal dementia because of the loss of neurons and brain tissue in these regions where it's typically delivered. Oxytocin, uh, because it's a peptide, can't be given orally because the stomach would just chew it up like it does any protein, but it can be given intranasally where it can be taken up directly by the lymphatic system and the nerve endings and delivered to the brain. With that background, uh, we then wanted to do a study to see if we gave oxytocin to patients with frontotemporal dementia, uh, could we boost that brain signaling that we saw was low when they were looking at facial expressions? So we did a follow-up study um, with uh, professional and amateur actors from the region, um, videos of facial expressions that they were making while the patients were in the fMRI scanner. And what we did see indeed was that in those frontal and temporal regions, on the visit when patients received oxytocin, we saw increased brain signal, increased brain activity here depicted in red in the frontal and temporal lobes, also seen here and here, relative to the visit when those same patients received placebo, which was just a saline spray. So this was really exciting to us as a, a kind of proof of principle that even though these regions of the brain are affected by the disease, there may be some latent capacity or ability of those regions to increase their activation. And that by giving this additional oxytocin, we may be able to find the receptors that are still there um, to, to try and restore some of that function that was there before. So with those findings, um, we and others were ready for the next step. So we started a clinical trial and I think I saw some people in the audience were, were um, family members of participants in this trial. The acronym is FOXI for the Oxytocin Study in Frontotemporal Dementia. And it's happening at 11 sites across Canada and the US. Um, I don't have the study results yet because the trial is still enrolling. Uh, we've had about 60, six or so participants uh, in the study already. And so we need about 34 or so more. And once we get to that total of 100, we'll be able to unblind the data and to compare um, to see whether there was any benefit kind of in the real world day-to-day -day lives of our patients and caregivers um, on oxytocin. So I hope um, next year, maybe the year after, depending on how quickly it goes, I'll, I'll come back to you um, with those results. For the third and, and final part of um, tonight's formal remarks, um, I wanted to touch a little more on the symptomatic treatment and then we'll segue to what we call the disease modifying treatment. So symptomatic treatments of which oxytocin is one potential treatment are really trying to address those symptoms that we experience um, day to day in patients with FTD. They're not targeting the underlying molecular change. They're not targeting the tau or TDP43, but often they're targeting the neurotransmitters that we understand are most relevant to whatever that behavior or symptom is. In contrast, disease modifying treatments is the term that we use for treatments that are trying to prevent that abnormal um, accumulation of those tau or TDP43 molecules in the brain, or for example, in Alzheimer's disease to block the amyloid and tau with the goal that they would stop or slow neurodegeneration and loss of the brain cells. Most of our current treatments for symptoms of frontotemporal dementia tend to target the serotonergic or serotonin systems in the brain, usually trying to increase serotonin uh, because levels of serotonin tend to get low in the frontal lobes during the course of FTD. And low serotonin can be associated with agitation, irritability, depression. So we often use it for those symptoms. Dopamine is another system uh, that's often targeted in FTD, 
so far, usually with medications that block dopamine, uh, because they can sometimes help with restlessness, um, more extreme agitation or um, psychosis where patients really are, are not understanding reality at all. Um, but in, interestingly, you know, we may be seeing in the future some attempts to increase dopamine signaling as that's thought to be one possible approach for apathy, but it needs further study. I just quickly wanted to highlight some of the current symptom, uh, treatments that we use for symptoms in FTD and um, some of the things that are, are on deck in the future. I won't go in too much detail here, but we can return to these in the question and answer period um, where, where there may be questions. For disinhibition and impulsivity, we don't have great treatments, but we do try things again that restore serotonin in the brain. And certainly we try to look at safety issues and minimize those with attention to non-pharmacologic interventions um, as are listed here in green. There are some clinical trials trying to target disinhibition and impulsivity, both pharmacologic as well as um, uh, technologies uh, to do that. And again, um, these are mostly in progress. So in future years, I, I'll bring you updates of, of whether they were successful. Agitation certainly has some overlap there. We always think first of what might be causing a patient's agitation. Um, are they in pain? Is there a tooth problem, uh, arthritis? Are they simply bored and have a restless boredom? Um, and think about non-pharmacologic interventions such as exercise and music. When those fail, again, we tend to turn towards medications that boost the serotonin systems, including trazodone, paroxetine, citalopram. Um, there are some smaller series of other medications, though those are not as well established. And then again, some new um, directions that we'll update you on in the future, looking at lithium, looking at uh, synthetic can uh, cannabis um, derivatives, um, things like robotic pets and some medications that have been successful in agitation for traumatic brain injury. Um, I've already touched on the, the sympathy and empathy. We don't have any treatments approved just yet, which is why that's been a focus of ours. Um, and really it's providing caregiver and family support to, to help understand that it's not something the patient is intentionally um, doing. Um, and again, we talked about uh, the FOXY study. There are some other um, studies going on looking at web-based trainings. Um, so again, that stuff we'll tell you about down the road. We don't have effective treatments that are proven for apathy yet. We can borrow a few things off label. These have been shown in rather small studies and, and may have some side effects themselves. So they're not routinely used. Our best treatment for apathy is not pharmacologic, but it is a tailored activity program. Um, and that's something that, that the team at McCormick Home is really expert on, but it's um, giving prompts and, and having a schedule and, and setting the patient up for activities uh, so that they don't have to think of them or start from scratch and it builds on their strengths and routines. Again, some more work on apps for that and um, uh, we'll see what comes in the future. So in summary, when we're looking to treat the symptoms of FTD, we have some evidence for efficacy for the following symptoms, agitation, aggression, uh, disinhibition and some compulsive behaviors, um, typically those modulating serotonin or the antipsychotics, which modulate dopamine. Uh, we don't have the treatments yet for empathy or apathy per se. And one of the challenges is that when we try these treatments, it's really difficult to predict an individual patient's response. We know some patients respond to these medications and others don't. So at this point, it's really a trial and error. When we think then about um, the longer term and, and certainly the next generation or those that may be at genetic risk for developing FTD but haven't yet, um, certainly you know, there, there's a lot of attention and hope that we all have for disease modifying treatments for frontotemporal dementia. I think everyone here knows that we, we don't yet have those that have been proven effective. So nothing yet that can slow or certainly not reverse the neurodegeneration. And I think practically and realistically, we're hopeful that things would be found that could slow it or in the best case, stop uh, the progression.
if we think about um, the, the sort of um, best leads in the field right now, a lot of them are stemming from the focus and the clues that we get from genetic forms of FTD. There are three most common gene mutations that can cause FTD worldwide, and they're listed here. The MAPT, the granulin in blue, and the chromosome 9 ORF72 in yellow. And because each of these gene mutations has been identified, um, it gives us clues as to the problem that's causing dysfunction in the cells and a target for therapies. In the case of the granulin mutation, we know that patients with this mutation lose the production of that normal protein, and so they have half as much granulin in their blood and in their brain as the rest of us. So treatments for granulin mutations are trying to boost the levels of granulin in the brain. Some of these are small molecules, which would be more typical medications that you take orally that may boost granulin production on the healthy gene. Others are antibodies that were developed and are given from an IV infusion that target different receptors in the brain that might increase granulin levels. And there are also some studies now looking at viral vectors. So this would be a virus that's been altered, so it's not dangerous, but it's given um, to patients with the granulin mutation and the virus has been manipulated. So it now carries a healthy copy of the granulin gene and can deliver that to the cells of the brain where it's taken up and they start to produce more normal granulin. Uh, this is just a, a picture showing that this is an adenovirus, which is a, a virus that can cause the common cold. In the laboratory, the virus's DNA is altered so that the new therapeutic gene is inserted. The virus is put into a, a special kind of packaging. Um, it's delivered uh, to uh, the participant or the human. It's taken up into the cell and into the nucleus. And then the cells translate that viral DNA with the gene that has been delivered to it um, and make that protein. So certainly this is an approach that's been studied for a long time. It holds a lot of promise, uh, but still um, in research stages. We don't have clinically proven viral vectors yet. For the c 9 orf 72 mutation, um, while there are some studies looking at antibody infusions, uh, one of the most exciting from my perspective are um, treatments that are looking at or trying to use something called antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs. Antisense or oligonucleotides or ASOs basically work like this. So on the left, we're starting with our DNA. That, those are our genes, our genes and our chromosomes. And normally in our cells, our DNA um, replicates itself into one strand and that's called RNA. And our cells use this RNA as a code to make proteins. And that's how our cells normally work. If there's a mutation in the DNA, it's basically a misspelling in the code. And so we end up with an error in the RNA. And that error in the RNA is then made into a protein that's a little bit abnormal. It has something wrong with it. And for these disease-causing proteins, typically that error in the protein is enough to make the protein no longer processed normally by the cells. So traditional drugs have really targeted these abnormal proteins, trying to bind them, to clear them from the cell or to prevent their function. The antisense oligonucleotide drugs work a little differently. The DNA with the mutation here is made into RNA, but the ASO is basically a synthetic string of RNA that is made to be a mirror image of the part of the gene that's mutated. So this mirror image RNA, the ASO, binds the cell's RNA, and that binding prevents it from being turned into a protein. So this is quite an elegant and more direct way to block the formation of that abnormal protein. So this approach has been successful in a neurologic disorder that affects infants called spinomuscular atrophy. Um, which was a devastating disease where infants who had the certain mutation typically would not ever walk and would often not live past their first or second year of life. ASOs engineered for the mutation in that disease have now meant that these children 
um, are living well beyond uh, that initial prognosis and are walking. And it's, it's really been miraculous. So um, in many other genetic disorders um, affecting the nervous system that produce these abnormal proteins, um, ASOs are being developed and um, coming to clinical trials to see if they may have similar benefits. So um, I mentioned that a lot of these clinical trials in FTD, the ones that are furthest along are really targeting genetic forms of FTD. Now I know 60% of FTD is, is what we think of as sporadic. It's not clearly genetic or not strongly genetic. And while there's still a lot of research trying to tackle sporadic FTD, it does present some additional challenges. It is still hard for us um, to predict what the underlying molecular pathology is in a patient with FTD if we don't have a gene mutation known. We can guess and, and we can be better than chance as to whether it's tau or TDP43 or one of those others that I showed you in, in the rainbow um, pathology slide, but we're not perfect. And if those treatments need to target a specific, specific molecular change, um, that's one of the challenges that still hasn't been met in the field. The other challenge is in making an early diagnosis. So, you know, as many of you know directly, the symptoms of FTD can come on gradually and they might not be obvious at first. It may look like depression or anxiety or new substance use or a midlife crisis or relationship challenges. So um, in cases where it's not known to run in the family, typically the diagnosis you know, isn't made until someone is a good five years or so into the symptoms. And of course, if we have treatments that can only slow or stop the progression uh, that can't reverse it, then we really need to get better at making the diagnosis as early as possible while quality of life is still very high. So with that, um, in the, just the last couple of slides, I just wanted to touch a little bit on some of the basics of clinical trials, as you will be seeing more and more opportunities uh, for clinical trials in FTD, whether it's here in, in London or Southwest Ontario, um, across Ontario, Canada, and certainly internationally. The first thing is that there are different phases of clinical trials. So there's preclinical, where studies are done in the Petri dish or in non-human animal models. In phase one, typically they enroll healthy younger adults to make sure that low doses of the new drug are safe and don't affect any of the organ systems or have toxicities that aren't expected. And they gradually increase the dose that's given to those healthy volunteers to make sure that the dose they think they need for the beneficial effect is safe and tolerable. In phase two, they tend there to enroll the patients of the disease that's being targeted. And those are mainly still looking at the safety of the drug with larger numbers of participants and a longer duration of treatment. And they'll start to look at some efficacy data, whether it works or not, but those studies will not be the proof of efficacy. If a drug makes it out of phase two looking safe and possibly effective, then it goes to a phase three study where a larger number of patient participants receive the medication on a repeated basis in a way that at the end of that treatment period, um, it's typically compared to the placebo and they can determine whether or not it seems to improve um, the disease course compared to patients who did everything the same in the trial but didn't get the study drug who got a placebo. So once trials finish in phase three, the FDA or Health Canada review them to determine safety, safety and effectiveness. And then if they are approved, um, once they are approved, there's still some uh, post-approval um, study to make sure as a wider variety of patients receive them, they appear safe, but that's much less formal and typically goes on for a much longer time. For those of you that haven't participated in a clinical trial, but, but may want to consider it, um, it's just a, a quick slide of what happens. So um, typically, if you uh, reach out to a center running a clinical trial and it's thought that, that you might be eligible or your family member may be, you'll typically be sent or presented with lots of information about the study in written form and consent documents that explain the study, 
the risk, the benefits, the design, and, and what's required to participate. If uh, that were something you wanted to do and you sign the consent, then next a screening visit uh, would happen. And this is where um, questionnaires are, are completed, cognitive tests are done, typically blood is drawn to make sure that kidney, liver, um, and other function is working. They're typically baseline brain imaging scans, usually MRI or sometimes PET scans, and um, ECGs or, or measures of heart function as well. If someone is deemed um, to pass the screening visit, that means that they don't seem to have any other medical problem that would make them likely at risk uh, by taking the medication. And they do seem to have the features that are targeting, um, uh, the study is targeting to, to see if it works, then they would be randomized. And again, it depends on what phase the study is. In most phase two or phase three studies, though, there will be a drug treatment arm and a placebo arm. So randomization would mean that you're randomized either to the study drug or the placebo, or possibly to different doses of the study drug. Then depending on the study, there are what we call interval visits, which are check-in visits, where some or all of those measures that were done at screening are repeated to continue to monitor for safety and effectiveness. Finally, at the end of the study duration, which is usually about one year, um, there would be an end of study visit where those things are measured for one last time. And then in many studies, and especially those that are run uh, through pharma um, companies, there'll be what's called an open label extension so that anyone who participated in the study, whether they got placebo or the study drug at randomization, after that year or two of treatment is invited to receive the study drug. That's sort of a way um, to thank them for participating. And that open label um, dosing is usually continued until the study is terminated. And that would be either because they find out that it's not safe, that it's not effective, or if the study um, is uh, looking promising and green lighted and goes for approval, then that open label extension will often be continued until the study drug is, is approved by Health Canada and the FDA. So um, I think those of us in the field and, and many, many of our families with genetic forms of FTD, you know, have seen the course of FTD and, and we know we need better things for the next generation of patients. So um, a lot of us are, are quite enthusiastic about participating in clinical trials where the rationale is good uh, because they are the one hope we have to find better treatments for others in the future. And I would always refer you if you're interested in looking at trials, what's in your area or elsewhere, or just learning about more, um, www.clinicaltrials.gov is the, the go-to site. You can enter search terms and um, it'll show you what studies are running, what studies are completed and contact numbers as well. So I'd just like to thank uh, the collaborators that have um, worked with my team in the clinic and on the, the research studies that I mentioned tonight, our graduate students and um, lots of people at Parkwood Western and then uh, around the world as well. Um, and I'll end it there. And um, thank you for your attention and certainly um, turn it over to you, Tara, maybe to, to um, moderate our Q&A here. Thank you very much, Dr. Finger. That, uh... Lots of information in there and um, very interesting to hear about all of the um, developments uh, and research right now in the different clinical trials and uh, yeah I look forward to hearing the results of the FOXI study when the, when they're ending come back and present them to all of us. Um, okay, so I think Allison is monitoring the Q&A so I'm going to turn it over to her to um, give you some questions. Great, thank you. There is a couple questions in there and um, folks, if you're interested, just populate the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen there. So to get us started, um, one of our uh, participants questions is, in the beginning of your presentation, you gave an overview of the differences between Lewy body, Parkinson's and FTD. Some of the details or symptoms that you mentioned seemed to match what I'm experiencing with my mom. However, her diagnosis was cortic corticobasal degeneration, part of FTD. So without being able to look at her brain, as you mentioned, is done to research these diseases after the person has died, how do we know that it is CBD and that she has not perhaps one of the other dementias? Yeah, so a great question. Um, I, 
cortical basal syndrome is complicated, but I think it's a great time to talk about it. And, and cortical basal syndrome, as, as you could see on this quite busy slide, um, comes under this umbrella of frontotemporal dementias. So I simplified things a little bit when I highlighted three main clinical subtypes of FTD, the behavioral variant, the semantic variant, and the non-fluent variant. But there are two, what we kind of think of as FTD-related disorders, PSP, which is progressive supranuclear palsy, and cortical basal syndrome, or CBS. Cortical basal syndrome is, is clinically defined by the emergence of symptoms um, that predominantly relate to changes in the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes. So if it's on the left side of the brain, our left frontal lobe is really important for expressive speech and word finding and speaking in grammatical sentences. And our left parietal lobe is really important for helping us keep straight left and right, um, for uh, calculations and math, and for um, planning more complex activities, actions really, and, and arm movements. If the symptoms or the disease starts in the right frontal lobe and right parietal lobe, then for the right frontal lobe, we tend to see the behavioral changes that we would see similar to those of behavioral variant FTD. And in the right parietal lobe, we tend to see less attention paid to the left side of the world, um, sometimes uh, some difficulties with dressing, with using a knife and fork or utensils, uh, or handwriting on either side. And then classically in cortical basal syndrome, um, we'll see not only trouble with the frontal and the parietal lobe, uh, kind of here and here, but the, the basal brain, the basal ganglia. So those are structures deep in the brain that help to coordinate um, movement. And so we can see movement symptoms in cortical basal syndrome, which can be stiffness and rigidity, which can be tremor, which can be um, myoclonus or jerks of the arm, dystonia, which is a fixed abnormal position of the arm. So cortical basal syndrome can have a lot of different symptoms depending on which of those regions it's affecting. Now, cortical basal syndrome comes under the umbrella of frontotemporal dementias because it does involve that frontal lobe involvement although not usually temporal lobe. And if we look at the molecular changes that are underlying a patient's cortical basal syndrome, sometimes it's an FTD related pathology. So sometimes it's a tau pattern that is similar to tau we see in FTD. Sometimes it's TDP43 like we see in FTD, but about 30% of the time it's actually Alzheimer's type pathology in the cells. It's amyloid and tau, but it's presenting like cortical basal syndrome because the amyloid in tau is mainly in the frontal and the parietal lobe. So cortical basal syndrome is I think one of the more complex, um, both to diagnose and to disentangle. And it, it has those multiple potential underlying um, cellular causes. Um, we wouldn't yet be able to say for sure which of those underlying cellular causes um, causes any one patient's cortical basal syndrome. There's been a fair bit of research to see, you know, do any of the clinical features predict that, that Alzheimer's was the cause versus one of the frontotemporal degenerations. And, and so far, none of the symptoms, none of the cognitive patterns, and none of the imaging features uh, reliably tell us what the underlying molecular change was. So the only way to know for sure is if we do look at someone's brain tissue um, after they've passed away, or if we happen to find that they have a genetic mutation um, that causes FTD. Great, thank you. And um, to add to that original question, um, this participant was also wondering, um, their parent is 82. And so just wondering if cortical basal syndrome has, um, comes along with any age um, connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say, uh, not, not necessarily. So cortical basal syndrome, we can see um, really at any of the ages. And I think uh, that includes the older ages. Um, while frontotemporal dementia can also happen at the older ages, it's, it's more common, as I mentioned earlier on. 
but cortical basal syndrome, especially because Alzheimer's pathology can underlie it and aging is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Um, we can see cortical basal syndrome present in one's 50s, but also 60s, 70s, 80s, or, or even 90s. Great, thank you very much. I have another question here. Um, this person has a family member diagnosed with FTD. How would we be able to get them enrolled in one of the clinical trials? Sure. So um, depending on where you live, um, one answer is certainly if you've got a, a neurologist or a geriatrician or a geriatric psychiatrist that's following you for the condition, um, to reach out to them uh, to ask if they have any trials at their site or they could refer you um, to a site with trials. If you're in the southwestern Ontario region, um, most of the trials being run, whether for FTD or Alzheimer's Lewy body disease are, are run here in London. Uh, so that would be mainly at the Parkwood site, either through myself, my colleague, Dr. Steve Pasternak, or our, uh, geriatrician colleagues, Dr. Michael Bory, Dr. Jenny Wells. Um, I intended to, and um, maybe if I can, I'll, I'll put it up now, if I can make a quick slide, um, just to put our, uh, um, coordinator, uh, Sarah Bess, uh, sorry, Sarah Gesso's um, email and telephone uh, for those that would um, like to reach out to her. If you're in Southwestern Ontario, she can tell you about our studies and, and answer questions and um, uh, certainly uh, let you know if anything's a good match. And sorry, I'm just um, oh, trying to see if I can type that in. Maybe I can type that. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll keep going. I think maybe a new slide will be the easiest way here. Um, and if you want to go ahead and ask the next question, I, I can probably try to do both here at the same time. Okay, no problem. Actually, I, uh, I'm impressed with the multitasking. So <laughs> um, the next question is actually connected uh, to the um, uh, oh, that one has been removed. So never mind. Um, I, I guess uh, actually it was. I think it was a good question. It was in regards to: Is there any specific um, um, characteristics that they look for when they're choosing people to be enrolled in the um, clinical trials? Yeah, great question. So it depends on the study. Um, trials that are targeting uh, the symptoms um, will often have very specific inclusion criteria about that symptom, of course, having to be present um, and sort of, you know, maybe the absence of other symptoms that would confound it. For the disease modifying trials, it, it varies. Often they start out um, by looking at patients of any severity, but what we've learned from lots of trials in Alzheimer's disease um, is that perhaps some of these uh, that may be very good ideas, um, might be started too late where they're no longer effective. So the trend we're seeing is that uh, clinical trials of medications that are aiming to be disease modifying, aiming to slow or prevent the disease, um, tend to be looking for patients in earlier and earlier stages of disease. So often that means quite mild stages. And some are even looking at prodromal stages where maybe someone knows they're at risk because of a gene mutation or um, they do a screening PET scan and find that their brain might be starting to accumulate amyloid and that they're at higher risk of developing symptoms, say of Alzheimer's disease in the next few years. So it varies study to study. Um, you know, if you looked worldwide, there would be some for every stage of disease, but, but any one time it, it may be focused on an earlier late stage, depending on um, again, whether it's a symptomatic trial, a disease modifying trial, and um, uh, really what the experimental medication is. Great, thank you very much. Next question here is, are there any other specific tests like genetic testing to diagnose FTD? So the diagnosis of FTD right now is largely um, clinical. And so when we see someone in the clinic, according to the current criteria, uh, we can make a diagnosis of possible FTD if they have the symptoms, um, but maybe they don't yet have the imaging changes on MRI. 
Um, we can make a diagnosis of probable FTD if they meet the symptom criteria and they have signs on the imaging of shrinkage in the frontal or temporal lobes. And we can only technically make a diagnosis of definite FTD um, if they've had the symptoms and then we find that they have a known disease causing mutation or if after their death, again, we've, we've looked at the brain tissue and confirmed an FTD uh, pathology. Um, so we don't yet have other biomarkers though. They're, they're in the pipeline. Um, there are some increasingly exciting studies looking at blood biomarkers, um, which at this point will most likely be able to help rule in or out Alzheimer's disease. And so that may be one important step in the future in FTD is to have a blood test to, to make sure it's not actually an Alzheimer's disease mimic. Um, there are PET scans and spinal fluid studies that can also do that to, to kind of rule in or rule out Alzheimer's disease. They're not used clinically in Canada yet because um, Health Canada hasn't approved them, uh, largely because they, they don't think it would affect treatment enough yet, since there aren't really proven uh, disease modifying treatments for Alzheimer's disease. But I think um, hopefully that'll change, uh, change soon. Great. Um, and sorry, just I think you had mentioned, Alison, I was just looking in the chat for the younger family members. So if um, you know that there's a gene in the family or you concerned their baby because of the pattern of inheritance in the family, if you're younger and, and you don't have any symptoms, um, then what we need to do is refer you to genetics counselors who, who would talk with anybody about the pros and cons of genetic testing, um, especially in the absence of symptoms. Um, given that we don't yet have proven treatment. So that's a, a pretty um, standard pathway and, and it's quite individual. And, and many patients who, or people I should say, who might be at risk, uh, but don't have symptoms, choose not to find out their genetic status at this point, um, though a small percentage you know, feel that that's the right decision for them. And, and in that case, we and the genetics counselors can help them navigate that. Perfect, thank you very much. And uh, Tara, right now, that is all of the questions that are in the Q&A chat box. All right, well, I guess have one more call in case anyone has a question they're sitting on there. Feel free to type it in now. Um, wait a minute for that. All right, I don't see anything else coming through. Um, if anyone does have questions after, you can always email them to us. Oh, one more. Um, email them to us and we can pass them on to Dr. Finger as well. Um, if anyone thinks of anything afterwards. Oh, and that's just someone saying that it's great talk and very informative. So. Yes, yeah, a couple um, very appreciative people out there for this talk, um, but there is another question here and um, it is what are the timelines from research to for the different dementias? Not sure how to word this, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, if it's um, referring to sort of the prognosis or the, the time courses. Um, maybe I'll start answering that and, and certainly just correct me. Okay, <laughs> I see the yes there. So at the individual level, it is quite variable and I don't mean to hedge there, but, but we do see some people progress really slowly. Say for example, with FTD, progress slowly and others progress quickly. So for frontotemporal dementia, the average um, kind of time from the time of, of clear diagnosis to the time of advanced dementia or death averages about seven to nine years. Um, again, that's the average. Certainly we see people you know, short of that and longer than that. If frontotemporal dementia comes with ALS, with Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, then the, the prognosis is much shorter and it tends to be around two to three years. If it's the semantic variant of FTD, um, not always, but often it's a longer prognosis. And certainly we follow patients for 15 or 20 years with semantic variant who, who change at a much slower rate. In Alzheimer's disease, uh, similarly on average from time of diagnosis to time of advanced uh, severe end stage dementia or death, averages again about seven to 10 years. 
Um, and Lewy body disease uh, might be a little bit shorter than that. It, it tends to be slower at the beginning. And in Lewy body disease, we can often see a pretty good stabilization of symptoms um, on medication for the first few years. But once we get past that early stage, then it, it does tend to accelerate. So uh, similarly for Lewy body, um, we're, we're in that same ballpark, probably six, six to nine years or so. Great, thank you. And there's just a, a question uh, about the email address. So it's uh, sarah.jesso at sjhc.london.on and Sarah's with an H dot Jesso, J-E-S-S-O. Thank you. I realize and I apologize. Um, I think I forgot the dot CA at the end there. So if um, anyone is still there, uh, if you just add a dot CA, the phone number there is right. Um, but if you're going to email uh, London uh, dot on dot CA, and I'll just see if I can stick that back up. Um, hold that there. Thank you very much. Um, there is another question here, just um, in regards to, um, sorry, here we go. With, um, any thoughts or research on CBD timeline? Yeah, so in CBD, again, you know, Probably in the, the literature, the, the average rates are going to be in that similar range of about six to nine years. Um, what I will say is that um, CBD, you know, or cortical basal syndrome, um, if we catch it early, often it's pretty subtle. So, so sometimes patients will uh, just have some trouble with their hand, and often it's kind of mixed diagnosed as carpal tunnel because they feel like they're getting cramping in the hand but really it's, it's not compression at the wrist, it's the signal from the brain that's inappropriately telling the, the muscles to contract. So we, we do sometimes see patients who've had subtle symptoms like that, you know, for three, four, even five years. Once the cortical basal syndrome starts to affect language um, or behavior, um, then we do tend to see things kind of speed up. So it, it tends to have a slow phase and then, um, you know, by the time they make it to our clinic, usually in the next three to five years, unfortunately, there's pretty rapid functional decline um, to the point of, of advanced dementia. Thank you. And someone here wants to know how long do genetic tests take? Yeah, so the tests themselves are um, pretty quick. It's a regular blood draw. Um, if you're a, a patient, then typically um, the Ministry of Health will pay for the testing. So there's a, an a, um, application process that the clinic would do. Um, and there's a, a new um, lab that's being used now by um, Canada and it's much faster. So we used to take about six months to get results and now we're seeing results come back. Um, within two months. Excellent, thank you. And a couple of folks have asked if this talk will be available after tonight. So I just wanted to um, remind everyone that the session is being recorded and eventually will be posted on our website. And we uh, are out of questions right now. So any other thoughts out there? And some great questions. Thank you very much for putting those forward. One more just came in. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, what are signs of ALS with FTD? Mm, yeah, so the FTD of ALS can look like the behavioral variants, it can look like the non fluent language variants or a more subtle language. Uh, but the symptoms of ALS are pretty consistent. And so ALS 
is defined by trouble with the motor neurons. So um, typically patients start to notice weakness that could start in one arm or one leg or in the face. Um, and, and they see progressive weakness. Eventually they might see some rippling of the muscles um, when we examine them in the clinic, we find signs of upper motor neuron disease. So that might be um, brisk reflexes and, and what we call a spastic tone, some, some tightness um, of the muscles. And then also signs of lower motor neuron disease, which is when ALS affects the motor neurons in the spinal cord. And that might be loss of the muscle bulk a lot of shrinkage of the muscles, that rippling of the muscles, which are called fasciculations. Um, and then a special EMG and nerve conduction study is, is how we confirm uh, that those indeed are the troubles happening to the motor neuron. So um, ALS, you know, again, might present as weakness in a limb. Um, if it's in the face, you know, it could be new trouble swallowing due to weakness, trouble chewing, um, seeing less movement of the face. I'll mention, I mentioned the fasciculations or muscle twitches. Now, you know, most fasciculations are not ALS. It's very common for all of us to experience that sometimes, especially if we're tired or we've had a lot of caffeine and probably, you know, one many of us can relate to is sometimes if you're tired, you may feel a little muscle twitching under your eye. So, and most fasciculations are benign, but, but that is one feature that we, we can see in ALS. Thank you very much. There's no other questions at this time. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Finger. It was a very informative presentation as usual. And uh, we look forward to having you back again uh, next year and getting some updates and seeing uh, what else is new in the uh, all of the research that's going on. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Thanks so much for the opportunity to chat everyone. I, I miss seeing everyone's face. So hopefully next time we'll be able to do it in person. And, and I um, should also just say, especially knowing a lot of people on the call, you know, a, a huge thank you to our patients, to their families, to their caregivers, because um, they're the ones first that inspire us, um, that motivate us. And then practically, they're the ones that enable the research through participation. So without them generously donating their time, their effort, their stories, their blood, um, literally, uh, you know, we wouldn't have um, anything to work on. So, so thank you um, to all of you. Um, and of course, to the McCormick team who, um, you know, just are the best at what you do in, in helping our families and patients. So you also are a big source of inspiration and motivation to, to us in the lab and the clinic. Awesome, thank you. And we're so lucky right, being in London to have all these um, opportunities for the research and the clinical trials, right? You don't get that everywhere. So uh, we're very lucky to, to be so close and have that available to us. All right, so um, just to let everyone know who's on the call, um, we will be sending you out an email tomorrow um, with a, a link to a survey monkey. Um, so we ask if everyone could take a few minutes and um, fill out uh, the survey for us to give us your feedback on tonight's presentation. That would be wonderful. It helps us to plan future presentations um, like this um, that we will be working on for down the road. So thank you everybody for coming and um, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Wonderful. And I see just one more question. I'll answer um, typing if the meeting's still connected. Uh, but my quick answer is um, just if, if someone's had uh, five years of a diagnosis of depression that they've seen in their family member, when should we ask for an MRI? Um, I would say, you know, a new cognitive or behavioral symptom, especially if it's not responding to treatment, you know, would be a reason to get an initial MRI to rule out a stroke or other cause. So if it's been five years and they haven't responded to typical treatment, then then now would be a reasonable time to suggest that. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank All you. Right. Bye bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye, everyone.